Thanks a lot. Um, actually, when I originally gave the topic of the talk, I hadn't read through a piece that I'd written some time ago, about a year ago, about the foundation of the term intellectual property and how dangerous it can actually be. I'm sure many people have heard RMS talk about it as well, but it is actually quite a dangerous term. One of the most dangerous things about it is that people seem to believe that it has some soil in the common law. It's embedded, it's a deep and old concept which we attack anew. In other words, it is something that's been here for a long time and you're a bit of an iconoclast if you go and break it. And so I thought there were one or two interesting quotes which I wanted to pepper my talk with and I went back and I looked at a judgment from some time ago and I found there were so many quotes in it that I thought quite a bit of my talk, I'll just frankly share them with you because what I'm going to do is I'm going to be talking about some quotes initially from a court case that happened hundreds of years ago when a bookseller in Edinburgh had a bit of a punch-up with a bookseller in London and the result of this punch-up was concluded in the House of Lords which pretty much settled what we think of and what we know as copyright which then went on to the United States and became the basis of what was thought of as copyright then. And why it's interesting to talk about this is to look at some of the thoughts that were had at that time and how I think I've probably discovered a bit of an RMS of that time, which is uh, 1774, uh, except I don't think he's quite as moderate as RMS is. Um, and I bring this up to talk about how we should always obviously question our axioms and in so doing find out whether actually we are really part of a deeper mainstream than we sometimes feel we are. It's easy to take the propagandists uh, at face value and say, well, actually, we're doing something new here. We are on the fringe. We are part of an organization that hasn't really had its metal tested properly. I would say that what we see in the proprietary world is actually the aberration. And you can find that in some of the discussions that I had over here. So I will go on and lead on to the discussion of what my talk was originally going to be about, which was, of course, um, free as in markets, and how indeed the freedom implicit in free software, rather than the kind of technocracy which is usually discussed in the term open source, is what actually gives businesses their best opportunity. And indeed, free markets require the kind of bounty that free software gives. Um, capitalism has always required bounties. People often don't think that it does. But actually, capitalism always needs a bit of a free lunch in all senses of free. Um, sometimes that free lunch has been slavery. Then they got rid of slavery and actually found that there were these good things you could do with coal and steam. And then, of course, we all know what the 20th century's free lunch was, and that was a lovely bit of solar energy in the form of oil, which um, we're now finding the lunch is coming to an end and we wonder what we're going to do next. But all capitalistic and free market developments have required, at its basis, what Bedell called a commons, have required that there be something there that little scurrying about mammals in the free market sense can manipulate and can use to their best advantage. And the proprietary world, if it were the only answer, would not provide this and would, as we are seeing with companies like Microsoft and indeed Windows Vista and so on, and its development was very telling, is that things do stultify. And the creativity that for whatever else you want to say about the capitalist or the free market system that is supposed to be at its core starts to freeze and uh, eventually cannot re replenish itself. So in a big irony, I think, the free software world is going to be the world that provides the best platform for the continued evolution of computing in a commercial environment. But before we do that, let's go back and see what, how the free software world's axioms, the notion of sharing and shared culture, and indeed some of the broader questions about um, software patents, about the over, overreaching of those people who want almost perpetual copyright and so on, uh, have, have, are affecting people and have, how they've affected people in the past. Now, originally, uh, patents were basically a, a bribery. Somebody said, I want to do X, they would go to the king and they'd say, I don't really wish to have any competitors. If I give you some money, will you ensure that I don't have any competitors? And the king said, yeah, carry on giving me money and I'll ensure that you don't have any competitors. 
And that's basically what patents were. They were a way for the king to raise money to fight wars and so on. And, you know, it, 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 think of patents in that sense as basically just another one of those ridiculous medieval taxes that we think of like windows taxes and things like that. Just ways of raising money, ways of restricting trade. That's where patents come from. Indeed, the original notion of a patent, letters patent, were exactly that. And in England's, uh, the English Revolution, indeed, they swept all that away. Uh, now, copyright has an even less auspicious start in the Western world, particularly in England, in that it was actually used as a form of um, censorship. Um, naturally, when cer certain despotic rulers came along, they thought a good way to deal with this unruly printing press is to create basically a little protection racket of the, what would now be called content owners, who would then police themselves, because it was in their interest that nobody else was allowed to do what they were doing, and, of course, the monarch would ensure that it was a very tightly regulated system. So, basically, we have a, a way of raising money for wars as the basis of patents and a way of running a kind of censorship protection racket as the basis of copyright. Now, that's not an auspicious start. And, of course, when the, after the... Um, what was then called the Glorious Revolution, or the Inglorious Revolution, as sometimes it's now called, all that was swept aside. And effectively, there was a new fresh start. Now, some of the, what today we call content owners, were rather upset about this, and they petitioned Parliament, and they got what was called the Statute of Anne, which was the first copyright act in the sense that we know it today, which was allegedly there to promote the arts and the useful sciences. And it, it did this for, it allowed, for, basically allowed the copyright term to be 14 years. Now, still this wasn't good enough for the content owners of the time. The Disneys of the time, of course, said, we want more. And they carried on petitioning. And eventually they said, hold on a moment. What, the, the, whatever the Statute of Anne says, we've got a common law right. We have property here. And as you can do with any property, our descendants should be able to inherit it and it should be ours and our descendants for forever, basically. So there was a big argument, and eventually, as I said at the beginning, this argument distilled into a final argument in the House of Lords, which was, is copyright just something that society has bargained for at the moment and needs to be reconsidered, or is it really the notion of intellectual property or literary property, as it's called there, something that's really in the soil and kind of natural, part of the common law, as it was said. And I'll now take some quotes, which is actually from the um, Cobbett's Parliamentary History of England. And basically, the appellant started talking and he reports, and he says, we need to rescue the cause of literature and authorship from the hands of a few monopolizing booksellers. Now, I hope I don't really need to continually say when we're talking about booksellers, of course, we're also talking about big media companies, software houses, and so on. So it's interesting, even in that time, 1774, that was a concern, and it's a concern that obviously is, has repeated itself. And um, indeed, what, what's quite amusing, bearing in mind where we are, of course, is that it was put that one of the booksellers, a, uh, Donaldson, was, of course, the Scottish bookseller was being accused of piracy, and, and he said, well, and, and, and his uh, counsel said, well, when the question concerning literary property was latterly agitated in the Kingdom of Scotland, they found themselves justified in affirming that no such property ever existed or ever was claimed in any civilized nation, well, England accepted. And so at this point, of course, there was no real notion of intellectual property at all. And when we talk, when they discussed the stationer's company, which was that protection racket I told you about, they said, like every despotic prince, they wished to crush the liberty of the press. The booksellers, however, acquiesced in this act because such of them as were members of the stationer's company were benefited by it. So it's interesting that we can see that vested interests are understood at a very early time as well. And... Um, we can see how much it has little to do with the author. The book that they were arguing about was called The Seasons by Mr. Thompson. And they said, 12 or 13 booksellers are hovering like eagles over a carcass about the remains of poor Thompson. I hope their lordships will protect those remains from such hungry vultures. So, you know, this sort of language, talking about big media as these vultures having very little to do with the creative process, as you can see, uh, it has a hundred years old antithesis. Now, what we have over here is another comment. What property can a man have in ideas? Whilst he keeps them to himself, they are his own. When he publishes them, they are his no longer. If I take water from the ocean, it is mine. 
If I pour it back, it is mine no longer. So you can see these ideas of there being some kind of shared culture there beyond the kind of atomization of it are being discussed at a very early age. In a sense, the notion of a creative commons is much older than the term. And this is, these are, of course, what you would expect the, um, the Appellants Council to be saying. Uh, what's more interesting is what Lord Camden, who was one of the law lords at the time, discusses in, in one of his, in his findings. Um, uh, and uh, I shall go on to what he has to say at the moment. And I'm going to just almost quote verbatim because virtually everything he said is pretty much fantastic. He t first of all talks about these precedents and arguments, the propaganda that the content managers the content owners, the booksellers of the time were trying to say, well, this is a natural right, it's, it's theft if you go against it, and so on. It's part of the common law. And he says that, no, all that you discuss, all your propaganda, were founded on privileges and corruption, all of them the effects of the grossest tyranny and usurpation. And yet, by a variety of subtle reasoning and metaphysical refinements, have they endeavoured to squeeze out the spirit of the common law from premises in which it could not possibly have existence. And what, what's one of the most wonderful phrases ever, and I, I'd love to use it myself from now on when I hear these content managers talk about things, he says that all these citations and precedents, all the propaganda, he calls it that heterogeneous heap of rubbish. And he says it's calculated to confound your lordships and mislead the argument. And um, as he says, the stationer's company assumes powers of seizure, confiscation and imprisonment. And this worries him because, of course, he says, when an organization that is supposed to be there to protect its own members starts to have quasi-state powers, this is not really something that a modern state should allow. This is, of course, in 1774. When we hear that the RIAA, MPAA, and the uh, various software alliances going around getting people audited, wandering around these offices with the police to help them with the audit and so on, one begins to see modern ways that this is happening as well. And it's interesting, of course, lobbying also happened at that time. He talks about after the revolution, when everything was up for grabs, the lobbyists, quote, came up to Parliament in the form of petitioners with tears in their eyes, hopeless and forlorn. They brought with their wives and children to excite compassion and induce Parliament to grant them a statutory security. They obtained the act and again and again sought further legislative security. That again is very familiar as anybody who has fought software patents in the uh, European Union, for example, knows that they come back again and again. They bring the stories of the starving software author who needs these poor little patents to protect him from the big wide world. This was known about some time ago. And again, he says, while they are in his brain, talking about ideas, no one indeed can purloin them. But what if he speaks and let them fly out in private or public discourse? Will he claim the breath, the air, the words in which his thoughts are clothed? Where does this fanciful property begin or end or continue? So again, people are thinking very hard about what exactly is this so-called intellectual property and what basis can it have for all the very strong laws that are being, were being proposed then are indeed now being proposed here. And finally, he comes out with some of his best quotes, and uh, we, 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 I'll continue with these and then move on. But he says, he says, are there any public principles of sound po policy or good sense? So, okay, even though it doesn't have its soil in the common law, is there actually really a good reason? Is it really promoting people? Is it really helping the, the arts and sciences? And he says, as his founding principle, if there be anything in the world common to all mankind, science and learning are in their, in their nature publici juris, and they ought to be as free and general as air or water. Now that's why I said he's pretty much like the RMS of his time. You can almost imagine that coming out of RMS's mouth. And he says, they forget their creator as well as their fellow creatures who wish to monopolize his noblest gifts and greatest benefits. Why did we enter into society at all but to enlighten one another's minds and improve our faculties for the common welfare of the species? People given the gift of genius are entrusted by providence with the delegated power of imparting to their fellow creatures that instruction which heaven meant for universal benefit. They must not be niggards to the world or hoard up for themselves the common stock. 
So here is not some countercultural revolutionary. This is a law lord in the 18th century saying these things which were then part of a very significant prevailing thought. Well, basically I'm saying that this movement is then doing is it is rediscovering something that was perhaps forgotten about the revolutions that happened around the Enlightenment. And that is that a shared common culture cannot simply be atomized in a very simple way apportioned out and sold. And if it is, then eventually you are going to deplete the common stock and all business will suffer, and I mean business in all senses of this world, word. And that's basically what we can see happening now if the patent mongers had their way. I happen to be a co-director of a little um, web hosting and managed server company that's only been using free software uh, and a particular GNU Linux since 97, 98, so it's for 10 years now, mostly Debian and latterly some Ubuntu as well. And what our customers are very interested about is not what often you hear people talk about, which is of course, oh, how much is it going to cost for the licenses? How much is it going to be the total cost of ownership? That's not actually their particular concern. What we find time and time again that the real unique sale for free software is not what the open source people would say, which is, oh, it's a collaborative effort which produces good software and it's uh, peer reviewed and all that. That's lovely. What the key sell is the freedom. It's that if they want to change something, they want to adapt something, they want to do something in a way that's completely against what was originally thought of, they don't have to answer to anybody to do that. And we find this with organizations and companies that they themselves have no idea how they would even achieve that freedom. They realize how useful it is. To give a very simple example, very recently we are writing some changes to the Simper mailing list server, which we are then going to redistribute the patches up to, main, to the uh, mainstream in order that it can be continued. Now, the organization that asks us to do this knows very little about programming and software and how it can be maintained. What they said is, we know that you're using free software, you did the hard sell on that. Can you actually do these things and change them radically so that it works exactly how we allow them, what you want them to work? And the answer was, yes, we could. And this came as a very interesting counterexample to them. So what they're told by the other side of their business, where they run things like Microsoft Exchange servers and so on, where the only real opportunity to change things is to basically cross your fingers and hope it comes in the next release. Now, when we're thinking about it, is that really the way a mature, competitive, multinational organization is going to be expected to develop itself in the information age, keep its fingers crossed, and hope that it will be fixed in the next release? Because that's basically all that the proprietary world allows you. And when it comes down to that fundamental choice and that fundamental point, people actually do get it. They don't get it immediately because they like to see the flashy installer and they like to see the good marketing. But when it comes down to it, people really do begin to appreciate that freedom. A, few, a couple of years ago, I was at a, what was called a Microsoft Open Source Briefing Day. Um, very curious to see what they had to brief about in open source world. Uh, they had a very good buffet. You will get a good free lunch from Microsoft, I'll give them that. Phil Hans was also there and Microsoft were talking about their installer and their updater and so on. And Phil Hans put up his hand and said, I don't care how well you think you're doing, you're never going to have a package management system that is universal or as good as the Debian project. And the Microsoft guy kind of laughed and said, never say never, you, how can you predict the future? And what the Microsoft guy was mis misunderstanding and how he was missing the point is that it isn't that Microsoft couldn't do it technically, it's that Microsoft's own business model prohibits it from doing it. Because to be able to have a system that basically upgrades coherently, is kept up to sync with from the smallest package to the largest uh, application, that software has to be free software. And we all know this, even people who like MacOS, they know that the Apple updater will update its little Unixy bits, it'll update a bit of the GUI, but you're not going to find that, say, your um, applications are going to be updated at the same level, because, of course, they can't be. 
Photoshop wants you to buy a new version when it updates. It doesn't want to be updated seamlessly with the rest of the operating system. If you're running Microsoft software, maybe some of their software will update. But of course, there'll be other software on that machine which is not allowed to be updated. So we have here walls constantly put up that prevent the system and the software and, by consequence, the business from operating at its most efficient and most competitive way. Now, at the moment, not enough people know about this. But I can tell you, and I've seen enough people in these 10 years who start with the proprietary mindset, and after they've used our services and people like our services and suddenly realize what you can achieve, they begin to realize what it is that they've been missing all this time. Those little niggles and frustrations and that feeling of disempowerment, they thought were just part of being a computer user. And they suddenly realize it's not actually be a part of being a computer user. It's part of being somebody who relies on proprietary systems. And as somebody told me the other day, one of our customers, he says, you know, I've come to realize, because it's quite an irony that originally he said he was a great kind of Microsoft fan. He says, you know, I've come to realize, he says, you know, there are a number of these laws. Um, we all know, we all, we all know the, 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 the laws and, and the the corollaries and so on that people talk about Moore's law and so on. He says, basically, uh, my, my little law, I won't say who he is because he's part of some organization, he'd probably be fired for saying such dissident things. He says, if, if you mess about with proprietary systems, eventually they are going to bite you in the backside. And he says, that is basically, as, as night follows day, a truth that he has now discovered. More and more people in more and more high-flying parts of the world are discovering this. And it's thanks to organizations and projects like the Debian project that they're able to find themselves a new bounty to replace some of the older bounties that are now being depleted. So I'd like to thank everybody from my company, because we couldn't have done it for 10 years without everybody who's helped. Um, we try to give help back in certain ways by distributing patches, by sponsoring things, and God help us hosting Richard Stallman's website. Um, but there's nothing that we could do that would quite be able to thank you enough for all that you've provided us. So thanks, everybody. I'm not sure if there'll be any questions, but if there are, I'm happy to ask, answer them. Hi. Yes, I was uh, curious. I couldn't quite understand if you were suggesting that you think copyright law is a mistake. Um, it's not so much that copyright law is a mistake, but what is a mistake is to assume that the same system that you have in this thing's working now, is it? Um, I was, I was, it's not so much that copyright law per se is a mistake. Um, there are perhaps pragmatic arguments to be made for it, and there is a discussion to be had. What seems to be a mistake is to assume that the status quo is pretty much all there is, and we can sort of tinker and build with that. What I was trying to show with these quotations is that a lot of people have put a lot of thought over the centuries into what exactly it, this so-called notion of intellectual property is. And especially now that we have computing and networks that are able to... Um, replicate information at effectively zero cost. There are huge new questions opening, and they're being answered by very old answers, um, stale answers. Effectively, the music industry, for example, until very recently, has wanted pretty much to use the law to um, protect its corporeal way of doing business, and it hasn't actually adapted its business to the new technology. One of the geniuses that's supposed to be the geniuses of of, of capitalism is that it's not sentimental. Basically, if it were a proper and true free market, when the record and music industry found itself under attack, it should have adapted or died. It should have found a way to use these new creative ways of doing things, or frankly, it should have gone out of business. That industry should have died. That's what capitalism is supposed to do. When the printing press arrived, the scribes didn't suddenly find a big lobby which was able to cripple the printing press. The scribes suddenly realized that either they get a new job, they adapt to the situation, or they'll find themselves out of work completely. 
Now, one might say that that's a bit unfair or cruel to the scribes, but that's the way the free market works. What I find interesting and ironic is that those organizations that supposedly represent the biggest forms and representations of capitalism are constantly trying to opt out of the free market. They're trying to find ways to stop competition, to give themselves monopolies, to prevent copying, to prevent things from entering into the tumult of the market. So my answer to you is, no, of course, we can't just say, let's have an anarchic free-for-all. The answer is, let's actually kind of press the reset switch and find something that's more adaptable to the world we find ourselves in because heaven knows the mess of IP regulation that we have at the moment is not doing a particularly good job for anybody at the moment, it's certainly not protecting artists, it's not protecting musicians. Um, as software patents become more and more invidious, it's not protecting software authors either. So my answer is we need to kind of redig the earth. You mentioned software patents. Um, what's your opinion about the validity of software patents? My opinion about the validity, and it's only a, an opinion, is that there is something peculiar and peculiarly unnecessary, peculiarly anti-democratic and very anti the whole human spirit about software patents because what effectively they do is something that patents were never supposed to do. They don't just say, this particular instantiation of something corporeal I've got a very good idea about, and for a small period of time, while I get into market, I'm going to try and make the best I can out of this invention. After which, and the very important corollary is, after which, of course, the free market kicks in again. What software patents are doing is, we're very good mammals that have kind of evolved away from the dinosaurs. While the dinosaurs were lumbering about, we were flitting about and uh, finding all sorts of clever things to do. Effectively, it's saying, stop being clever mammals and be dinosaurs again. You know, don't... Once, once you, if you have an idea, even if it's pretty obvious, screw you. Somebody else has had it already, it's partitioned. Once you start partitioning ideas, it's no better, frankly, than attacking the freedom of speech. And in a very real sense, I think software patents are an attack on the freedom of speech, really, because they stop people from discussing, implementing, and hacking on important ideas. It's nothing to do with inventions in the true sense of the word. It's to do with everything that makes our, our species what it is, inventiveness. And there's a very di big difference between the two. So I think they're ludicrous and they, were only, they only came about because of a little, uh, frankly, a bit of a mistake that happened in America and that mistake has now spread like, like the most pernicious weed I've ever known. Yes. I'm uh, Knut Irving from Norway. We have the best copyright law in the world, and we I pity you from Great Britain and the US trying to rewrite the law, copyright law, because uh, you don't risk people in these co two countries, and that's just two countries. My sister was, uh, was a state secretary of Norway in trade and commerce, telling that it was actually just five people, five uh, countries that pr uh, pushed the copyright law in the wrong direction in all over the world, and that's US and some banana repu republic, she said. And she's a top politician, so kind of that's the Northern New Europe view on how, well, let's say it bluntly, uh, corporate America tried to change the world. The good part is that they are now losing. One part of losing is the Apple case when the Norwegian Consumer Office, Consumer Ombudsman, just says that you need to be able to pray, play your MP3 uh, uh, files, your music, whatever, on any device of choice. The Norwegian government in the parliament saying that it's totally doable making uh, digital restriction management, we call it the uh, Movie, digital movie ticket uh, uh, as free software. You are explicitly allowed to do that. We had the DVD, John, and this guy, you know, it's not, the problem is in, to, to say, to, when I've said all, that, uh, all this, is that what we do wrong in free software is that we're telling about what the US doing wrong as it is applied in everywhere where else. Then when we, we are actually helping people to believe that that is the court situation, it's not. 
We should tell about the good countries. We should tell about Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and other countries that don't do the stupid things they do in the US. Well, yeah, I agree. And in a sense, the US had better watch out because I'll actually take one of the last, one of the last, the, one of the last quotes from Lord Camden, actually. And he says about these people who tried to restrict things in his time. And he says, when once the bird is out of the cage, Ireland, Scotland, America will afford her shelter. And what then becomes of your action? Now, of course, today it's not sadly Ireland, Scotland, or America, but indeed there will be other countries, you know, the, some of the northern European countries, um, some of, of course, the Far East countries, who will say, fine, spend all your time fighting with each other about uh, patents all you want. You know, let the sun set on your empire in this kind of ridiculous decadent squabble, because look what we're doing. And the biggest irony is that the corporate America will be its own downfall if they carry on like this. So, um, but that's always what the case. I, kind of, I said in a, in a little piece I wrote that one of the things I want to see is I want to see digital restrictions management get ridiculously tough. I want people on the street to become very annoyed by it. I want them, everybody to kind of, I want these corporate um, owners to get their way and to get to have all their dreams won because frankly when they do, the whole thing will come collapsing down. We all know what the worst thing for the temperance movement in America was, and that was that they actually got prohibition passed. Because, you know, that's what caused everything. Once everybody suddenly realized what prohibition meant, you know, the whole thing fell apart very quickly. So I kind of want, almost want that to happen. I want the worst to happen, and then the whole thing will just collapse very quickly. So in a sense, you're right, but in a sense, I kind of, I kind of want the worst to happen. I kind of keep my fingers crossed that they try their best, because the harder they try, the harder they'll fall. Do I, do I have time? You have time for more. Okay. Thanks. Touching on the international nature of this, now that everything's global, like everything is global, doesn't it make copyright law and intellectual property and all that pretty much irrelevant now because it can't be defended globally? So, it, you know, what's the point? Why bother now? Because <laughs> everybody can have anything and do whatever they want, pretty much. Well, again, I mean, the point I, the point I just read out there, and, you know, they kind of realized that 250 years ago. It seems some people still don't quite realize that. And if that, if that was true 250 years ago, how much more true is it now that we actually have global networks? Um, it's not that some sum is that book is disappearing and then reappearing in another country. We have global networks. So of course, what people are trying to do is they're trying, they think that DRM is going to protect that global DRM network of DRM. Well, we all know that that's pretty much mathematically, if nothing else, impossible. It's not going to work. And uh, it, it, it's interesting to see the initial signs with Steve Jobs and his small capitulation and so on, that already before I even thought it would happen. It's already, it's so tarnished. I think some media companies are now saying, can, can we call it something else rather than DRM? Can we call it lovely fluffy bunny protection or something like that? They're desperately trying to find a new way to rebrand it. So kind of the things that needed to happen to, to aid its collapse are already happening. And you know, every time the RIAA prosecutes another child or brings some single mother up there, you know, that's, that's, that's plus one on the score. You know, I, I rejoice every time that happens because we all know what that means. Pe you know, people are not convinced by such actions and people are also not convinced by some of the things that Microsoft are doing. Effectively, every time you turn on your computer, it checks to see whether it thinks you're a criminal or not. And, you know, if it does this subtly, that's all very well. But, you know, Vista and other programs are doing it ever, ever less subtly. And it's beginning to annoy people and it's beginning to annoy important people who run very big networks. And I think that as you say, yes, it's a global issue now. It's an issue about information that can go anywhere over the world uh, for, at, the, at, at the speed of light. And frankly, antiquated laws that were established in the 18th century are not really going to stop that. Just uh, one small comment more because you're saying let's get it let's get it worse before we're gonna get it better. That's your 
So just a strategy, uh, yeah. Well, it, it, it's, it's a kind of, if it has to get worse, I want it to get very much worse very quickly. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of, uh, to be practical, uh, I'm a practical of... guy. Hmm. Uh, and uh, what, uh, the thing is that you, it's a hard job to fight in the political space because we are engineers. You, you just hate it yeah. because it's all kinds of, deliberation, so why can't you just make it cold? But over. we need to be there. And that is my point. That it's actually better to have it, to take the political fight to them. That's better than making things worse. It's better to say to the parliament, politicians, say the consequences that you will not be able to compete in the digital arena. And what actually has happened uh, is that the US and Great Britain and some other countries has given away their technology leadership economically to the Northern Europe. And we, I'm traveling all over the world and thank them because they have done so because we can earn fucking more money on mm. their behalf. So yeah. please help us doing that. Yeah, uh, and I, I, I'm pretty much finished, so I'll, I'll end on one last quote because I think he, you know, go, go and look, look this up. Type Lord Camden online and copyright and find it because, you know, just reading through his findings are wonderful. And he basically talks uh, about the content owners and he says, instead of salesmen, the booksellers of late years have forestalled the market and become engrossers. Uh, this per perpetuity now contended for is as odious and as selfish as any other. It deserves as much reprobation and will become as intolerable. Knowledge and science are not things to be bound in such cobweb chains. And I think I pretty much agree with him there. Thanks.